<laughs> All right. So the last few weeks, we've been in a new series called The Beatitudes, How to Be Blessed. In week number one, we talked about how it's important to be poor in spirit, to recognize that you need Jesus, that you can't do it on your own. The second week then, we talked about the next step up from that is mourning for your sin, realizing that your sin separates you from God, but then allowing comfort to come in as you ask for forgiveness and you receive salvation. The next step above that is humility, recognizing that God's ways are the right ways. And then that leads you to the place of hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Because after step three, you're empty. You've gotten rid of the garbage, so now you need to fill that space with something good. And if you will fill it with the right things, God will satisfy your desires. Well, today we're going to talk about the fifth step in this progression upwards of our um, spiritual maturity. We're going to talk about mercy. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, God, the word says, God blesses those who are merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. God blesses those who are merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. I've got a quick video clip this morning just to help us wrap our minds around a little bit about what this mercy truly means. Check this. Did you catch that? It was, no, you didn't hear it? Okay. Well, thanks for being honest. That's cool. Can we have lights back on? So at the beginning of this, he said it was pity that kept Gollum alive. It was pity that kept um, Bilbo from killing this creature that's now caused some issues. But then at the end, he goes on and he says, don't be too quick to judge out death and judgment. In other words, pity, mercy is an important thing because as human beings, we can't see all ends. We don't know what God has planned for someone's life. And you know what? We often don't know what has brought someone to become who they are today. So it's easy for us to be judgmental. It's easy for us to judge that book by its cover. But mercy, mercy is such a powerful thing. And the last thing he says is that mercy, pity, mercy may be the thing that decides the fate of man. And in reality, mercy is the very thing that has decided my fate and that has decided the fate of any person in this room that has called on the name of Jesus to be saved. Because you have received the greatest act of mercy imaginable. So this morning, as we move forward, I'm going to give you three requirements that you need to have mercy. To do that, we're going to jump into a story in Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 36. 
It says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his house and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard that he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt down, before, um, knelt down behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. All right, so this is kind of a crazy scenario. Can you imagine sitting down to dinner with your friends and having a complete stranger, maybe somebody that you only know by reputation and it's a bad reputation? They break into your dinner party and uh, they basically unclothe themselves and they, they start weeping and they start washing someone's feet with their hair, pouring out their tears, and then they take out their entire life savings. They break it open and they just pour out their entire life savings on this person's feet. This, this was scandalous. First of all, physically what she was doing was a huge no-no in the first century for a Jewish woman to let down her hair and to touch the feet of a man that she was not married to. I mean, this was, this was scandalous. I mean, this was not something that was going to be accepted well. So what in the world would have driven this woman to this extreme display of affection? Well, the answer is that something happens when you experience mercy. Something happens to you when you truly experience mercy. It changes the way you live, it changes the way you think, and it changes the way you act toward other people. Mercy changes things. Unfortunately for the Pharisee, he was so blinded that he was not able to understand what was going on. In Luke 7, 39, it says, When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, If this man were really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. The first requirement for you to have mercy, it requires trading love for comparison. If you want to have mercy, you have to be willing to trade love for comparison. You know, that's what judgment's all about. Judgment is all about making ourselves feel better at the expense of other people. It's all about looking down on someone else's sin, looking down on someone else's issue and saying, well, I don't have that. Look how much better I am. And we walk around feeling superior and feeling better about ourselves. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, Jesus said, Now, go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not, after sac not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. See, this is the key to mercy. Understanding where you've been, understanding what you've done, and understanding what Jesus has done to get you where you are today. That's how mercy happens. Judgment happens by walking around comparing yourself to everybody else, thinking that you're better than them. Mercy happens when you go, I've blown it. <laughs> I've screwed up in every way you can imagine. How in the world could I ever judge someone else? In Luke 7 verse 40, it continues. Jesus answered the Pharisee's thoughts. He said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then Jesus turned to the woman and he said to Simon while looking at her, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash, my, wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and she's wiped them with her own hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss on the cheek, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the common courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. 
I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. You see, the level of mercy that you give to others is directly proportional to the amount that you have allowed yourself to receive. If you are a judgmental, legalistic jerk, it's because you view God that way. If you didn't see God in that way, you'd be throwing around mercy freely in the same way that it came to you. This woman's love was extravagant. It's like she took a bunch of Mentos, put them in a Diet Coke, and it just went everywhere, right? Well, that's what it's like when you experience the mercy of Jesus. Your love is just going to go all over the place. It's going to get on everybody that's around you because you're not going to be able to contain it or keep it inside. It's just going to blow up outside of you because you have received mercy. Because when we receive mercy, we can't help but give it to everybody else. The problem is, is a lot of us are living like this Pharisee. So the Pharisee, he's looking at the sinful woman. And the Pharisee's thinking, you know what? I do pretty well. I might make a mistake once in a while, but I follow the rules. I offer all the sacrifices. And when I do make a mistake, I go and make it right at the temple. Look at me. I've got it going on. But this woman, whoo Man, is she a mess up. I mean, she screws up every single day. It's obvious just by her reputation what she is and what she has done. And so in his mind, his little bit of sin makes him better than her whole bunch of sin. Any of you guys think like that? Have you known anybody that judges their life based on trying to live good versus bad? Well, let me show you a demonstration real quick. So, uh, any of you guys ever been thirsty? And I mean like parched thirsty, like cotton in your mouth, can't really swallow, you're thirsty. Like you've been walking around all day without a drink of water thirsty. Okay. So, I want you to imagine you, you come in from outside and you're just, you just want a drink of water so bad. And so I offer you a drink of water. The problem is, both of the cups I offer you have poison in them. And it's a concentrated poison so that just one little drop of this poison in a whole cup of water, it's going to kill you dead. And so I offer you two different cups. One cup has just one little drop of poison in it, all right? The other cup, it's just full of poison. I mean, it's brimming full of poison, hardly any water at all. Which one do you want? Neither, right? <laughs> Guys, this is not a hard question here. <sighs> You're scaring me. It's because there's a third option. There's a cup that has no poison. Now, if I offered you this cup, which cup are, are you going to be more thankful that you didn't drink? Neither. Because both of them are going to kill you. This is the reality of sin. I don't care if you have one drop or if you just, you got a whole bucket full in your life. Either one is going to separate you from the Father and either one you drink from is going to kill you. This is the only one that can satisfy what you need. This is mercy. Because this isn't deserved. This isn't based on anything you have done. The standard of mercy is not about what you have experienced or what has been done to you, but what Jesus has done for you. Amen. That is your standard of mercy. So I can never say, you guys ever been through hazing before? You guys know what hazing is? So when I was a freshman in high school, I was part of a choir. And part of the choir experience as a freshman was, was freshman hazing. So the first trip we went away for, for the night, our teachers would just kind of turn their backs and allow the seniors to just torture the freshmen. And this happened year after year. Now, they had to tone it down a little bit one year because a girl got Nair put in her, ham, her shampoo. 
And uh, another kid got strung up naked outside. Like some bad stuff happened because we're, let's be honest, if we're left to ourselves, we're all Lord of the Flies, right? Piggy gonna die. I mean, we're just, we just go a little bit. If you guys don't know that reference, read a book, okay? Just find the book. It's, it's, it's an important read. But we do these crazy things. Why do we haze? Because we've been hazed. We treat others badly because we've been treated badly. But in the kingdom of heaven, that gets turned upside down on its head. In the kingdom of heaven, we treat others good because we've received goodness from Jesus. We don't keep doling out the hurt and the pain. That doesn't get us anywhere. No, we give out the good because that's what we've known. So with Jesus, the question is not how much is he willing to forgive, but how much are you willing to be forgiven? The Pharisee, if he truly understood his need for forgiveness, would have been just as merciful, just as extravagant in his love toward Jesus as the sinful woman. But the sinful woman allowed all of her sin to be forgiven. The Pharisee would only let Jesus in to a certain extent because his pride and his ego prevented him from saying, you know what, I've made a mess of things. Some of us need to identify more with the sinful woman than the religious guy. Because at least the sinful woman received 100% cleaning, where the religious guy just wasn't quite there. The second thing required of you to have mercy is you have to recognize the mercy Jesus has had for you. Unless you're willing to recognize the mercy that you have received, you will never be able to give mercy to anyone else. A merciful person understands the extent to which they have been forgiven. A merciful person becomes overwhelmed with love. Let me show you an example of what happens when mercy breaks down. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 23, Jesus says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who has decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay his debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please, be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and he forgave his debt. But when the man left the king... He went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and he demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until his debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and they told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man who he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I have had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had his entire debt paid. Mercy is a cycle. And it's a cycle that does not start with us. Mercy does not originate with us. Mercy originates with Jesus. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Say while. while. Jesus didn't save you after you got it all together. Jesus didn't wait to save you after you started going to church all the time, after your relationships got figured out, after you started tithing, after you stopped cussing, after, after, after. No, Jesus did it in the midst of that because you couldn't do it for yourself. This is the way God shows his love. And the third requirement of you this morning for you to be able to have mercy is it requires you to give up the right to get even. You have to be willing to give up the right to get even. I don't care. Let me rephrase this. 
I do care that you're hurting. I do care that you're broken. I do care that things have happened to you that never should have happened. And those things break the heart of God. And the way that I know that it breaks the heart of God is that he sent his son to die to fix that for you. God cares so much about your hurt, your pain, your mistakes, and the things that have been done to you that he allowed his own son to die to fix it. That's love. But it doesn't matter what has happened in your past. None of that is an excuse for you to do the same thing to other people. Because what you've received from the only one that matters is love. You've received mercy if you've been willing to receive it. You have to give up that right to get even with other people. If you don't give up that right, you break the cycle. So let me show you this morning. I, I'm really geeking out. I love this little race car that I got. Why are you laughing? So I love this little racetrack. It's in a site, it's a perfect little cycle. And if I allow this car, it'll just keep going around the circle over and over and over and over again. And this is exactly the way that God intends for mercy to work in our life, for it to just keep going around. We've received mercy from Jesus, so we extend mercy to others. Then they extend mercy to someone else, and then they extend it to someone else, and eventually it comes back around to us, and it just keeps going around and around and around. But what would happen... What would happen, let's say, if I uh, decided to, to stop being merciful? What happens to the cycle if I decide not to give up my right to get even? Will you turn that off, please? It goes off the rails. It goes off the track. And it crashes down. Some of you have experienced some tremendous accidents, breakdowns, and tragedies in your life because you were unwilling to be merciful. The only fruit that judgment produces is more judgment. So if you want your physical body to go to garbage, if you want the things of your life to go to garbage, if you want to live in misery and frustration and difficulty, then walk in judgment. But if you want the cycle to be completed and for mercy to keep going and to keep extending to you and you can ex keep extending it to others and they will keep extending it to others, guess what? Things are gonna go well. What would happen in our culture right now if all of us just decided right now that we were going to extend mercy instead of judgment? What would our lives, how much different would our lives look? How much different would our marriages look? Our families look. Our workplaces look. If we said no, instead of breaking the cycle, we were going to put it back together. And we were going to show mercy. In James chapter 2, verse 13, it says, There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. And guys, none of us can escape that day. None of us get out of judgment. We are all going to stand before God. But if we are merciful toward others, then the judgment we receive is well done, good and faithful servant. But if we walk in judgment toward other people, that same judgment is going to come back on us and there will be no mercy. There will be nothing to hold back everything that we deserve. And finally this morning, Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. And this is hard. How does mercy work? You have to make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. We're told today that being offended, it's pretty much the only way to live. I mean, right? You don't get up in the morning without being offended on Facebook within five seconds. You don't go anywhere without being offended. In fact, we have entire movements right now all around this idea of being offended because we think offense is empowering. It's defeating. 
If you allow yourself to be offended all the time and to walk around constantly upset with everybody around you, not only are you going to be miserable, but nobody's going to want to be close to you. And you get in the way of God's blessing in your life. No, the second part of this says, remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. The Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Pastor Tanner, it's easy for you to say, have you ever had this happen to you? Has anybody ever said this to you? Has anybody ever done this to you? And the answer for a lot of these conversations is probably going to be no. I'll be honest, I've been shielded from a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things in this world that I have not had to experience myself. But I'll also tell you this, if we're going to make comparisons, let's go back to the only comparison that matters. Because the difference between what you've experienced and what I've experienced is nothing compared to what we've experienced compared to what Jesus experienced. So if Jesus, who took on the entire sin of the entire history of the entire world, is able to forgive me and my brokenness, how in the world can I not extend it to another human being? Amen? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Lord Jesus, help us to be merciful. Help us to walk in forgiveness, to be understanding. Help us to be willing to let go of the pain and to entrust you with all of it. And Jesus, help us to receive the mercy that you offer us so freely. This morning, the greatest mercy that you can ever know is the mercy of salvation. And if you've never asked Jesus to have mercy upon your soul, if you've never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, to wash you clean and to make you new, you can do that right now. You simply say, Lord Jesus, forgive me because I am a sinner. I need you to wash away my sin. I believe that you lived a perfect life so that you could die as a perfect sacrifice for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the dead. And I believe that through your resurrection, you have the power to do anything. So Jesus, save me. Father, we thank you for every person praying that prayer. We thank you for every person right now wrestling with their own ability to have mercy or wrestling with their own ability to receive mercy. Speak to our hearts this morning. Help us to become more like you. In Jesus' name. I invite you to stand. Let's worship the Lord. All to Jesus I surrender
Jesus, I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessings fall on me. I surrender all, I surrender all, oh, to surrender everything going on in our lives over to Jesus. Our prayer team, they're coming up right now. They're going to be up here across the front. If we can pray for you about anything, anything at all, if you need to respond to the message today, you've got something going on in your life, we want to pray for you. If you need to go this morning, you can feel free to be dismissed. Please do go quietly. But we're going to spend a few moments right now in prayer as a congregation. Dan, if you would come up here, please grab the mic. First thing I want to pray about is, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but a lady left a few minutes ago. Her name is Catherine. Her fiance yesterday, they found him um, unconscious in his, uh, in his kitchen. And he was unresponsive, not breathing for about 25 minutes. And he's currently on uh, life support at the hospital. And so she's asked that we pray for him. And then after we pray for him, Dan is going to pray for Israel. Because if you've been following the news, Israel is under fire. The last several years, this has not been an issue because our country has been in alignment with our ally. Unfortunately, within the last couple of months, that has gone by the wayside. And now we are now supporting regimes that are openly hostile to Israel. Now, as Christians, we recognize that Israel is God's chosen nation. Chosen does not mean that they're better than us. Chosen means that they were the chosen nation to bring the Savior of the world into existence. And they still have a part in God's plan. So we honor the nation of Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we hope for the salvation of those people. So we're going to pray. Thank you so much for sticking around to do this with us. Lord Jesus, we lift up Rodney to you this morning, and we know that you are our healer. So we ask you to do a miracle in his body. Lord, it's one that only you can do. The doctors have said there's nothing else that they can do for him. So, Lord, we ask that you would move on his behalf. Father, we thank you for good doctors and good nurses. We thank you for surrounding him with your angels. Lord, we know that no matter what happens, that you are with him and that you are working in his life for his good. We pray for peace for Catherine. We pray that you would give her your comfort and walk with her through this and all of those that love and know Rodney, that you would be with them as well. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you. We thank you for your, your grace, your mercy, your kindness to us. But Lord, we also recognize that you are powerful. And what you have said about your chosen people, you meant it and you will protect them. And there is a promise that those who bless Israel will, will be blessed. And Lord, I pray that as a nation, we will stand behind Israel. Lord, I pray that we will 
forget about things that would the world might be saying against Israel and, and come to an understanding that we need to stand with her. And Lord, I thank you also that as those rockets come down, we know that they've been blocked and they've been blocked and they've been blocked. And we know that that's your protection. That technology that's allowing that to happen has all come from you. But Lord, the, the enemy is not going to stop. But we know you won't stop either. But you call us to pray. You call us to lift up those people. And, and Lord, I do pray for them because they are living in a, in a, a situation of, of fear. And the biggest thing is, Lord, that they still don't know the true peace of knowing you. And Lord, I thank you that you will be continuing to show more and more and more, opening up the eyes of the people of, of Israel to see exactly where their, their hope is, that you, Jesus, are the Messiah that they were looking for and that you have come. And Lord, I thank you that you're revealing that to, to them one after another. And it, But in the meantime, Lord, we do pray for your protection. Lord, I thank you for being with them. I thank you for, for strengthening them. Jesus, your mighty hand will not allow anything to cause Israel to no longer exist again. And we know that until the return of our Lord, until you come back, Jesus. So, Father, I lift up the people. I ask you to, them, to help, help them to take heart because you have overcome the world. In Jesus' name, amen. We have some solidarity pledges by the door as you leave this morning. If you'd like to stop and fill one out, you can grab a, a pen like I'm wearing today. It's just a, it's just a pen that, that shows that shows that solidarity with the nation of Israel. Guys, this is not a political statement. This is just us trying to do the right thing as the people of God. Let's continue to worship. Church, we love you. If you're able to stick around, we're going to worship and pray.